It started with some complaints we received from citizens in the area. I had just moved here and in the first week, somebody drove up our driveway, was talking to my neighbor, and came out and started telling us about this quarry. When you have a situation where you know that some of the rules are being violated, it's kind of natural. You make the assumption, you start asking the question, are they all being violated? And I was like, who is this guy and what is he talking about? And he seems like he's off his rocker a little bit, but little did I know that, that I, you know, I should have heed his warning because there were obviously citizens concerned long before I was here. The county never should have approved the mining. The lands hearing examiner back in the day was in opposition. The neighbors were, and they turned a deaf ear and a blind eye to that. It was socially irresponsible of the county to do that. There's people that rely on the industry that may not even realize it. There's people that would rather not have a quarry in our county that don't realize how vital that is to the growth and economy of our county. It always appears to me like that can't be right. There must be something wrong. They're doing something wrong. The growth that's happening in our community, rock is literally, quite literally, the foundation of all of that. The end point is not they're gone. The end point, I think, is they're going to have to operate differently. Bridge inbound. sand and gravel permits along with the quarry site plan have to be enforced. The county's elected or appointed mine inspector, which should be done, should work with code enforcement to protect codes and our environment. Local neighborhood associations should be listened to and be an active part of policing the quarries. My grandpa started the company 50 years ago last August, so we just celebrated our 50 year anniversary, which we're very proud of. Our first instance in Clark County was about 1989. It was the first time we got, got involved down here. Specifically at Mountaintop, we've only been up there since about 08, so just over 10 years now. It's the legacy of my family, you know, and I've seen some very hard times uh, growing up, and I've seen, um, I've seen us do very well, and it's economy driven, and we've, we've stuck out through a very cutthroat industry like it was back in the 80s. To the end user, it's construction aggregate, driveway gravel. It's used in concrete form underneath the foundations of homes, foundations of roads, highways, uh, railroad aggregate. I mean, you name it, if, if it's a foundation, there's an aggregate, aggregate need for it. We supply homeowners with their driveway rock, um, decorative stone for boulders and riprap. If it requires rock, it comes from an aggregate source. And whether that's a quarry or sand and gravel, that's where it comes from. Been in this house about 26 years. Been in Clark County just a little bit longer than that. And I am president of the East Fork Community Coalition, which is a group of people that got together to try to see what they could do about protecting uh, the community around here and most particularly out behind the East Fork of the Lewis River, which is a spectacularly wonderful place and needs, to, needs protection. We've screwed up enough of our natural resources already. If you think about the long-term plans for the quarry, it is to open it up so it is clearly visible. And I've never seen a handsome quarry. And 
I think that's just a terrible idea for a place as beautiful as this. The first thing was the noise. Starting, I'm, I'm thinking pretty clearly, they, when we came out of the recession and Clark County building and everything started to, to get busy again, so did the quarry business. And so it became much more noticeable at that point than it had been before, it had been there. And quite frankly, I was like a lot of other pe people still today looking for ways to ignore it. And it was my wife that finally said, well, you at least ought to understand what the heck's going on. And that's really when the uh, surface mining overlay expansion came up. S looked at some of the documents and I, it was just appalling. It's, it's the only word I can think of, it was just appalling. We moved into this home on Kelly Road uh, back in 2013 back in September 2013, shortly before uh, Clark County Council's ruling on some of the SMO and quarry activity. And at the time, we didn't know there was a quarry nearby. We really didn't start noticing the traffic as a problem, the truck traffic, until around 2015. I'm not sure what triggered that. About two years into living here, we just noticed a constant flow of trucks coming up Kelly Road, coming down Kelly Road, and our driveway enters right on Kelly Road. So we try to exit the driveway, there'd be trucks coming down, multiple trucks, multiple trucks going up. So we live on a blind corner. And so that was hazardous and a concern for us. And over time, uh, we just noticed a steady increase of truck traffic. The truck traffic is kind of a, a surface level concern. It's what you see most frequently and what's most annoying, but it's like the tip of the iceberg. It's, it's just the thing that you see below the water is much more potential danger and more concern. And I liken that to kind of some of the environmental issues, the more longer term impact that a quarry can cause. Well, I'm a research ecologist who studies how life responds to extreme disturbances. And so I have studied and worked for nearly 40 years at looking at how systems, when disturbed, uh, how they're influenced initially by those disturbance mechanisms and also what's the subsequent pattern of recovery of particularly plants and animals, but also fungi. So in terms of the Yakult Mountain uh, in my property in particular, I moved there for the sole reason of having a parcel of land, in this case five and a half acres, that's removed from an urban or even suburban setting in a rural environment where I could have a large garden, a couple of greenhouses, 2,000 square feet of garden under my greenhouse cover, berries, an orchard, chickens, etc. And it was a very tranquil existence when I first arrived. And there was no even inkling of a mine being present there. And so things suddenly changed uh, once, once the mining activity happened and not for the better. I've been involved in mining since I was 19 years old. If that tells you anything, it's been a long, many years, many, many, many years. I've worked for mines back in the Midwest that were three times, four times, five times the size of the Yakult Mountain Mine. I've been around heavy equipment my whole life. I've been around trucks my whole life. I've been around crushers, wash plants, and all that. So I'm really knowledgeable on that stuff, and I know what it takes, and I know what kind of dangers there are, and what kind of environmental issues there are that goes along with that. We moved to this particular area in 1991. I built this house in 1992, uh, at which time, to my knowledge, there was no quarry anywhere within, you know, within four to five miles from here. We purchased some property about four years ago. It's about 17.76 acres. It's right on the East Fork of the Lewis River. And I think the first time I noticed the quarry <laughs> was there was seeing the trucks and the traffic. Uh, coming in and out, I was like, where is all of this gravel coming from? Um, you know, I'm not opposed to gravel. Our road is actually a gravel road, but I was just had a thought, wonder what's going on. And then I was out on my property and I started hearing blasting. Um, my dog is very susceptible to sounds, large sounds, um, and he would run, he would bolt. So it was uh, obvious to me there was something going on. And I was, uh, was surprised that, that a rural management plan wasn't in place where we would have a gravel pit in a rural setting where there's so many people's homes. 
it just seemed so incompatible to me that I was really surprised. And then the expansion hit. Council was uh, asked to reconsider. They, an application was received from Stordal to expand the surface mining overlay area around the Yakko Mountain Mine to the east. And uh, with the intent of eventually mining it, but the more immediate intent was to use it to store overburden um, under which, cur which currently exists on the Yakko Mountain uh, top mine uh, surface and needs to be removed so they can mine the rock underneath it and eventually get to the point it'll be restored when they do the reclamation in the future. Uh, they just needed a space to do that. The initial CUP contemplated maintenance of the overburden on the Echo Mountain site itself, which was uh, consistent with DNR's requirement. It started with um, with some complaints we received from, um, from citizens in the area, concerned with the truck traffic on Kelly Road, um, specific to the speed and their uh, some of them were uncovered. Uh, I think all of them were uncovered. Uh, somebody reported a, uh, one of them had at some time in the past run off the road, um, concerned for the safety of the folks in the area and the noise, the repetitive noise created by the vehicles going over the road surfaces and so And that was um, early 2018. I've been in the port industry for the last 12 years. Uh, worked at the Port of Vancouver and then the Port of Woodland and then the Port of Ridgefield. So development and economic development has been a part of my, uh, my work DNA for, for a little over a decade now. And the association itself, as part of our mission, we champion our members, so the industrial and commercial builders and infrastructure builders in Southwest Washington. We champion their cause both from an advocacy position, but also a partnership and education position as well. The growth that w that's happening in our community, whether it's the explosive residential growth in Ridgefield, or whether it's the in, um, commercial and industrial growth in Vancouver, uh, Camas Washougal, or even Ridgefield itself, um, rock is literally, quite literally, the foundation of all of that. You can't have quality construction and quality development in any community without quality construction grade rock. As the rock pits around the county are drying up, um, it's, it's focusing even more of a demand on that pit and everybody is lucky that it's there. There would there'd be a lot of people that are looking for it elsewhere. The challenge of getting that aggregate to the county, to the job site, to the end consumer, when that price goes up, uh, people start looking for options to build elsewhere where it's a little more economical to, to do so. It's not just the, the people that specifically use the product that comes out of the, one of our dump trucks, you know, it's, it, it supplies jobs to the contractor that we're providing the numbers to. Because every project, whether it's a home site or a supermarket or a school, you go through the permitting phase. There's multiple companies and of those eight or nine subcontractors, maybe only two that we deal with directly, but they all rely on that product to get there. So their services are no longer needed if, if the aggregate's not there. I like to view this in terms of zones of influence. And depending on where you are relative to the mining operation or in pathways of that material leaving the mine, you have different influences that occur. And so this isn't just a localized close proximity effect of the mine, but instead it's influencing much of North Clark County in a deleterious way. So it's of great concern. Now more proximal to my concern is a single factor, and it's noise. I hear the crusher, and when I hear the crusher, it can, it can be so disturbing that it can waken me from my sleep through my closed windows, through my walls of my home, and it sounds like it's war-torn Kosovo with munitions going off, and it goes on for hours. Is it like that all the time? Absolutely not. But I've been keeping track of that, so I created a data sheet that looks at, at different levels from uh, non-detectable to present, but, but um, not continuous and not very loud. And, and I define it in more, in more specific details. Then an intermediate level where you continually hear it, but 
it's, it sounds somewhat off in a distance to what I just described when I started this, that it's, it's this really loud rumbling or horrific noise that's disturbing and distracting and actually drowns out the sounds of singing birds. We're not newcomers. I mean, I don't consider myself at all a newcomer. And we're not anti-development. It's just, there's gotta be some balance. Part of why there's so many houses being built in Clark County is because not only are the houses relatively inexpensive compared to other places in the metropolitan area, but because it's just a darn nice place to live. That needs to have some uh, weight in, in the decision making. Uh, if you look at the permitting process for a house and what, what a developer pays, part of that is for things like parks and schools and roads and all that good sort of stuff. And I think that uh, this, even if it ends up costing a little bit, there ought to be some component in there about the East Fork of the Lewis River and the Hathaway Trail and Lucia Falls Park and Moulton Falls. And because those are just tremendous assets that uh, we're fortunate, those of us who live in Clark County, we're, there, we're fortunate to have those. Not every place has stuff that good. Well, I'm, uh extremely concerned about the landslide issue. Just because the East Fork of the Lewis River is just an irreplaceable asset, it is the most beautiful place. I would hate to see any compromise happen to the steelhead, to any part of that river. So the landslide issue is probably my number one. We've been working on the Malton Falls Trail and trying to protect that area, and so I've done a lot of research in that geographical area of all of the past landslides. It, they're, they're there. It's just an area that is a volcanic area and its land moves easily. I was a regional hydrologist for the U.S. government, and then I got sent back to Stanford, Michigan State as a policy and program analyst training. And I worked out of Washington, D.C., and then I got sent out to, to the West Coast here, to the Portland area, to work on a bunch of natural, natural resources issues. And immediately I saw a lot of serious problems that I didn't expect to see, having worked in Montana and Idaho and other areas where there was a lot of mining. But I ran into some things here that really surprised me that they were still going on. I said, in my mind, I said, this isn't 1960. It's, you know, we're way beyond that, yet I see some of these things going. And to me, they were serious problems that involved both threatened and endangered species and uh, a water quality, clean water act. There's something very inappropriate here and, and we need to do much better because this area is so special and so unique. And having worked all over the West and worked nationally on a special team, we need to maintain the balance between the social and the economic and the environmental. Because that's why people like to come here now. It's not just the jobs, it's the other part of the equation and the balance, and that's what they're looking for. It's a rare find, and it's a long-term reserve, and we're excited to be up there, and you just don't come across a source like that. Counties don't come across sources like that. So it's unique, it's special, and I think it's, I think it's very viable to protect it, you know, long-term. There's people that rely on the industry that may not even realize it. You know, there's people that would rather not have a quarry in our county that don't realize how vital that is to the growth and economy of our county and the continued growth and the reason to continue to protect that resource. Because if nobody's looking out to protect a resource in 20 years, then we're gonna have to look for more drastic options. Oh. 
much to feel the way we made emotions. 